Thank you, Cam. Uh, we've started the recording and I want to call the meeting of the uh, Dr. Cog Regional Transportation Committee to order for Tuesday, July 19th, 2022. Uh, I am Kevin Flynn and I'm chairing this meeting. Uh, we are now in order. We have our first item as public comment and I'm going to ask Cam, do we have anyone who has joined the meeting who wishes to offer public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do see a hand raised for Mr. Jeff Coleman. Uh, and Hi, Jeff. Mr. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I just saw, first of all, want to compliment the Colorado Department of Transportation today um, for the accomplishments of Central 70. This shows what diligence and, and hard work over decades can, can end with. So a big applause to CDOT to Meridian Kiewit, to everybody that was involved with that project. So a big shout out. Second of all, I just want to make a brief comment regarding the letter that was provided to us um, following our, our last meeting. I was just looking through some of the data and there was a table on BRT lines. And one of the numbers, if, if these numbers are true, um, I want to provide caution to the board. Is this really a reasonable investment? And that is the State Highway 119 BRT route. It shows on this report that it would have approximately 3,000 riders at an investment of $253 million, the highest cost line. Only Colfax was even in the realm at $250 million. And so when you look at the cost per rider, I just question, is this an investment with that money? in order to solve greenhouse gas be better spent on um, other corridors such as the highly congested 270 corridor and improving that congestion. So that concludes my comments to uh, the board and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll relinquish the rest of my time. Certainly, thank you, Jeff. Cam, is there anyone else uh, in the participants, for example, who might want to offer public comment? I'm not looking at them right now. The attendees, rather. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't see any hand raised at this moment, but I did get a message uh, that Rebecca White and Jessica Micklebust will be joining at nine o'clock, and they apologize. Oh, and I do see a hand raised now from uh, Catherine Brack. All right. Please go Welcome, ahead. Welcome, Kathleen. Go ahead. Great. Um, good morning. I'm Kathleen Brackey, and I just want to clarify that my role here on the um, listening into the meeting this morning. Uh, normally, I serve as an alternate for the RTC for the Transportation Commission, um, but I also work for Boulder County Transportation, and today I'm listening in to the meeting in my role as Boulder County Transportation staff. So I just wanted to make that announcement for the meeting this morning. Um, we have a, an item on the agenda for Boulder County, and I'm here in case there's any questions related to that topic. So thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. I appreciate the clarification. Uh, Cam, is there anyone else? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will give it a second just to make sure if anyone does have a comment, <coughs> now is the time. Uh, and I don't see any hands raised, so Excellent. I believe that is, that is it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, can we have the agenda back on the screen for everyone? I'm flipping between screens myself, so it's crazy. All right, uh, item three is the uh, Meeting summary from the RTC meeting of last month, June 16th. Uh, the, the packet has been out for a week. Uh, does anybody have any comment on that? Please raise your hand. If not, we will assume that everything in there is okay. We don't need a vote on it, is my understanding. So uh, seeing no hands, uh, thank you for uh, reading the meeting summary of last month. Next item is our first action item, fiscal year 22-25 uh, TIP policy amendments and uh, Josh, uh, Schwank is going to give us the presentation. Josh, right. go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have five proposed amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program for the committee's consideration. Uh, the first is to the I-25 managed lanes project between 120th and E-470. Uh, the change here is really to refinance the existing private loan into a federal TIPIA loan in order to take advantage of some better interest rates that are available. Um, in order to meet TIPIA requirements, we need to show that loan amount within the current fiscal years of the TIP. So the change would be to move 
$23,630,000 from the prior year column into fiscal year 2023. So that's not new funding, simply moving within years. And then adding $4.8 million in new funding uh, to purchase some additional tolling equipment. The next project is for the I-70 and Piccadilly interchange. This would be adding $8.5 million in state faster safety funding uh, to account for a recent project award. The next is for the I-70 Floyd Hill project. This would be adding $6.3 million in state legislative funding um, and adding parking at the El Rancho Park and Ride site uh, to the project scope. Next, we have a new project being added to the TIP. Um, this would account for $34,241,000 in Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds. Uh, that's COVID-19 relief funding. Um, if you look at your packet, you'll notice that only $22,828,000 is shown within the current fiscal years of the TIP, but the remainder is shown in future years. And this funding is for transit operating assistance within the small urbanized areas in Boulder County. Um, some additional info is available in your packets in a couple letters from Boulder County, as well as the program of projects, which shows which specific routes the funding is intended to be spent on. Next, we have another new project being added to the TIP. This is for a $13,051,000 award of a federal raise grant to the city and county of Denver. Um, again, similar to the last one, you'll notice only 6362000 is shown within the current years of the TIP. The remainder of that is shown in future years. And this is for improvements to the Washington Street corridor between uh, 47th and 52nd Avenues in Denver. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions on any of these. Otherwise, there is a proposed motion available in your packet and uh, um, shown on your screen. Thank you, Josh. Uh, appreciate that very much. Kind of looks like you're sitting at the table that Vladimir Putin's been using, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> Apologies for that, Mr. Chair. There's, there's no You're, so, you're so far away. I can figure out anyway. I had to go to speaker view to make sure there wasn't a static picture and that your lips were moving. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first up is uh, Director Cook, Shelly Cook, go ahead. Hi, thank you, uh, Chair Quinn for Flynn. Um, and I couldn't find, I, I'm, I'm probably looking at the wrong version of the packet, but I, I didn't find the backup on the 34 million and now 22 million for the current tip cycle. Can you, uh, or Kathleen Brackney or um, anybody explain the next steps on that and um, how, is Boulder County operating those uh, routes or how is that, funding being used. I'm in, I'm kind of excited actually and interested in seeing it. So it looks like uh, Director Levy might have a response to that. Is that why you raise your hand? Uh, Commissioner, go ahead. Yeah, it is. Good morning, everybody. And um, I'll do my best. Uh, and I'm really grateful that Kathleen Brackey is here to uh, clean up any mess that I leave behind. Um, so this um, and Director Cook, thanks for the question. Um, this is money um, as the packet indicates, it's a American Rescue Plan Act, uh, small urbanized areas money. And the, in the program of projects, uh, some of it is going towards uh, supporting the hop route, which is a, a joint project of RTD in the city of Boulder. Um, some of it will go towards um, a, a transit from uh, between Boulder and Lyons. And these are not uh, routes, I guess, to, to your question directly. Um, these are not routes that Boulder County would operate there. Um, in some cases, we contract with VIA or um, we support in the case of the HOP, which is the Boulder based community transit system um, that just supports the existing parties that are already operating those routes. And then you can see, I'm just trying to scroll down as I talk uh, in the program of projects, um, just a number of other improvements and services that are being provided. Um, yeah, it mentioned and it will support um, the jump, which is an RTD, the jump, the bolt, um, and the um, the RTD transportation from Longmont to downtown Denver. So we'll be supporting all of those routes as well. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Does that uh, answer everything, uh, Director Cook? It does. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Director Levy. Much appreciated. Uh, are there any other questions on this or any comments, discussion? If not, I'd like to solicit a motion from a, any member to um, 
uh, which is on the screen to recommend this to the board. Director Levy. Um, thank you. I um, move that we recommend to the board, uh, the Dr. Cog board, the attached uh, amendments to the fiscal year 2022 to 2025 transportation improvement program. Thank you. Would anyone like to second that? Uh, I'll Please. second. It's Mike Silverstein. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Silverstein. Appreciate it. Uh, the uh, It's been moved and seconded to move the uh, this item to the board of directors tomorrow evening. All in favor, please uh, unmute and say aye. 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 If there is anyone opposed, please unmute and say nay or no, or either one. Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, uh, this is unanimously approved and we'll see this on the floor tomorrow night. Uh, item five is the uh, special interest seat appointments to the uh, technical advisory committee. Uh, the RTC needs to, uh, well, we don't need to if we don't want to, but we, uh, it is up to us to confirm these appointments. That's item five, Jacob Rieger, you are going to uh, do this for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You never have to, but I hope you do. Um, I know, I'm so always amazed by that <laughs> language. It's a, this must be approved by the city council. No, it doesn't, <laughs> but it may be. <laughs> That's Thank right. You. Um, so thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I um, wanted to bring this item to you regarding our Transportation Advisory Committee membership. Per our committee guidelines, we actually conduct an annual review of the TAC membership with our distinguished board chair. Um, we have several different types of membership on TAC. Um, some of the membership our board chair currently actually appoints directly, and that's the local government members. But we also have what we call seven special interest seats um, on our TAC. And Josh, if you could scroll down. I think to the next page. There we go. You see a list of those uh, seven special interest seats. These are subject matter experts in fields um, that are related to our multimodal transportation system. Um, you know, they bring a, a wide depth of expertise and really enrich our um, discussions and deliberations at TAC. Um, per our committee guidelines, the board chair recommends um, these individuals and RTC approves um, these seven special interest seats. So we do this each year. This year, um, six of the seats um, are filled, have been filled. Um, I've communicated with you, each of these folks to make sure that they are comfortable serving for another year if you all approve that. Uh, we do have one vacancy, which is in the aviation seat. Um, we had a, a person, David Euling, who's the head of the aeronautics at CDOT, um, aeronautics division, who uh, has served in that role uh, very well for a period of time, but asked to step off. Um, his current alternate is George Holikoff from Denver International Airport. We are recommending that he actually become the member. So that would be the one change in, um, in the seven special interest seats. So we're asking you to reconfirm the six that are currently filled and confirm Mr. Holikoff as the new aviation uh, special interest seat representative. Um, this is an action, by the way, that RTC takes directly. This is not go to the Dr. Cog board. Um, the reason for that is this relates to our uh, transportation planning function at Dr. Cog or Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, function of which RTC serves as that um, you know, sort of framework uh, with the three agencies and others who are represented uh, from Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. So this is an MPO function um, that you take directly related to our committee structure. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. But again, we're looking for a motion to approve these seven special interest seat representatives for our Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, Commissioner Stewart, you're up. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh... Jacob, I appreciate that. I just want to make a up to clarification under the TDM uh, non-motorized. Carson Priest is no longer the program manager. He is now the executive director of Smart Commute. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to make a motion to approve when it's appropriate. Excellent. Thank you for that uh, uh, news on the, the promotion. Much appreciated. Uh, director Shaw. Thank you. I'd be happy to second this motion. Excellent. Thank you. It's been uh, moved by Commissioner Stewart, uh, seconded by Director Shaw. Is there any discussion on this? See no hands for discussion or comments. Uh, let me call for the vote. Uh, all in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 If any are opposed, please unmute and say no. Hearing none, are there any abstentions? Hearing no abstentions, this item is uh, unanimously approved and uh, 
And that's all we need to do on that. Let me go back to my other screen. I, there's the agenda, thank you. I'm flipping back and forth. Some things about Zoom I like, some things are mind boggling. Uh, next item is one we're all looking forward to just part of the morning. This is the informational briefing uh, on the uh, greenhouse gas uh, analysis update. Uh, Jacob, it's all up to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me just a moment to share my screen and let me get the presentation set up. Sorry, give me just a moment. Okay, hopefully folks are seeing that in presentation mode. Yes, we do. Very good, thank you. All right, let's dive right on in. <clears throat> so um, again, first, we just wanna give you an update of, you know, the work is going so quickly and it's so complex as you all know. So we wanna keep having these, you know, um, routine and, and periodic briefings to make sure that you stay up to date on the work that we're doing um, and kind of where we're at with this process. So you all, I think, have seen a version of this chart before. Um, again, this is really just to try and lay out, hopefully in a somewhat easier to understand way, um, the complexities of the work and really the process in which we're using um, to conduct the work, sort of the kind of flow chart of the steps that we're taking. So I won't go to this into this in detail, except to say that um, I hope one message that's become clear by now and it's become clear to us as staff is that it's going to take a lot of things. We're building a framework um, to meet the emission reduction levels of the rule. And that framework is going to include a multitude of strategies. It's gonna take a lot of things, not just two or three or five things, but more like 10 or 15 or 20 things um, to be able to meet the requirements of the rule. Um, and many of these uh, we've been talking about for some time together as we're building that framework. Um, so just some key points, um, again, the concepts that we've gone through, um, as we've done this work over the last six months, we've talked about things like representing what we call programmatic um, investments. Uh, these are non-project specific things that are in our regional transportation plan. Uh, they're not typically in our focused travel model that we use to model uh, the plan and a big part of our work over the last six months has been how do we represent these programmatic investments that are in the plan and they're in the financial plan um, in a way that we could potentially model them or include them in our modeling work um, to capture their benefit, um, their GHG benefit as part of the GHG analysis. Um, I believe we've talked already a little bit and we'll show more today about uh, what we're calling strategic changes to the 2050 RTP's project investment mix. Um, we're looking at our project mix from the GHG rule lens perspective. Um, and we're also trying to, uh, through this work, create some additional uh, financial investment in our fiscally constrained financial plan um, that we can invest even more in programmatic investments um, in some things like signal retiming and optimization, especially by 2030, uh, so that we can do more of these things so that we can do them sooner, um, again, to help us meet the requirements of the rule. Um, I believe we've also talked a little bit about near-term land use forecast adjustments based on observed residential density increases between 2019 and 2025. Um, as I always say in talking about this, this particular one is not a strategy to meet the requirements of the rule. What it is, is as we've gone through our technical analysis um, and looking at sort of our inputs and our baseline and our assumptions, um, and all the things that go into the technical work. This is one where um, we've seen that the world, as we've observed, is occurring a little bit differently than originally forecast. Um, and so this is really about sort of, um, you know, seeing, seeing what's happening in the real world and sort of, you know, taking legitimate, you know, but transparent credit for that as part of the work that we're doing um, in, in the technical work as part of the GHG analysis. Um, we've also talked about telework rate adjustments in the focus travel model. Um, those were kind of set for us in terms of how the baseline is defined in the GHG rule. Uh, but obviously, we're also trying to be thoughtful about as we look at the at the GHG work, um, you know, COVID, post-COVID, um, our very, very, very clear crystal ball, I say sarcastically because nobody knows for sure, but try to be thoughtful about what's a reasonable sort of estimate of um, telework going forward into the future. Um, and then we've also started talking about uh, mitigation measures and the need. Um, we believe that we're going to need to do a mitigation action plan as, um, as part of this framework that we're building to close kind of that final gap to be able to meet the emission reduction levels um, that are set for us in the rule. Um, and I believe we've started talking about some of those potential mitigation measures, and we'll show a little bit in this presentation on that as well. 
So with that background, um, I believe you've seen a version of this table in the past. This is a newer version. Um, it's complex, and one of the things that we're trying to do is sort of standardize how we report um, sort of the various um, statistics that we need to report as part of the GHG rules. So we're standardizing the table in terms of million metric tons, which is a little confusing. Um, it's not something we all use every day in our work, but that's the measurement um, that's the measurement framework within the GHG rule. So that's why you're seeing a lot of decimal points. It's million metric tons. Basically, this is showing kind of both our baseline, um, which again, the rule defines as the plan as adopted and the plan as modeled when it was adopted back in April 2021. And then we're showing um, the work that we've done that I just covered in, in the key points in terms of all those different strategies that we're starting to deploy um, and how that's sort of showing up in our modeling runs for GHG analysis. Um, so you can see the model reduction from the baseline. Uh, we're also including something called off-model reductions. In the technical work, we have come to realize that there are many things that we can include directly in our model. Um, and we've done that. And we talked about the programmatic investments, the telework, some of those things we can include in our focus model. Um, but some things we just can't model, right? They're important things. They're part of the plan, but we can't model them. So in particular, recently, we've been working on what we call off-model programmatic investments. Um, these are things that, again, they're in the plan, they're in the financial plan, um, but we're doing off-model calculations to estimate greenhouse gas reductions, and those are included as well. Uh, we're working on those. And then finally, that final gap um, to, close the, to close the gap of the emission reduction levels to meet the targets is reductions through uh, the mitigation action plan. We believe that we don't need a mitigation action plan for the 2025 analysis year, but we believe we'll need it for the remaining analysis years that are within the rule. Um, and then finally, the final row on this table is the reduction requirement from the GHG rule, uh, directly from the rule from table one. Um, again, those are in million metric tons. So there's a lot of numbers here and these will keep uh, being updated, but we just kind of wanted to show you uh, both what comes from the rule and kind of where we're at based on our analysis so far. Um, we talked about project modifications to the RTP, the 2050 RTP. Um, again, here, the overall strategy is that we're looking at our project mix, our major projects in the plan, projects that we list in the table and that we map on, on a map, the lines and dots on a map. Um, and we're looking at that from the lens of the GHG rule. And we're asking ourselves as part of this overall strategy, are there sort of very strategic, very surgical things that we can do to the project mix in the plan to be a little bit more GHG friendly, um, to kind of, you know, do that part. It, again, it takes a lot of things, um, but that, that part to kind of help us meet uh, the reduction levels. So strategic modifications for GHG benefits, and as I said, additional programmatic investment as well, because we know that's going to help us meet the reduction levels. So there's some kind of buckets of things that we've looked at in terms of project investment mix changes in the plan. One is on a few freeway projects, uh, modified freeway managed lanes um, to focus on safety, operational, transit, other multimodal aspects related to those projects. Um, so they stay in the plan, but maybe the focus shifts just a little bit. Um, modifying the scope of several what we call Dr. Cog administered roadway projects. Um, these were competitively, competitively allocated projects when we originally developed the 2050 RTP. Um, we have some projects in the plan there that are um, six lane projects and we're looking at, you know, can we remove the six lane component to refocus those projects? Again, they stay in the plan, but maybe instead of going from two lanes to six lanes, they go two to four lanes, or if they're four lanes, maybe they stay at four lanes, but we pay special attention to the problems or the issues that these projects are trying to solve. Maybe it's intersection related, maybe it's safety, maybe there's some pinch points, uh, maybe there's some multimodal things we can do. So again, it's keeping the projects in the plan, uh, but it's maybe slightly refocusing the investment related to those projects. And then a big one, um, and we talked about bus rapid transit earlier, you may recall the 2050 RTP based on uh, the NAMS work, based on RTD's regional BRT study and other things to find a really robust bus rapid transit network within the plan by 2015, um, multiple corridors that we would complete together as a region, we'd fund together, we implement together as a region over time. We've been looking at, can we actually advance some of those corridors, do them sooner, capture their GHG benefits sooner? Um, so a pretty aggressive sort of an idea here uh, to try and um, advance some of these corridors uh, within the overall 2050 RTP. And then finally, if we do all of these things, um, then we start changing the fiscally constrained financial plan a little bit uh, to do a couple things. One is to reallocate and some finance 
um, some dollars so that we can front load some of these projects that we've talked about. And as I alluded to earlier, we also try and free up some additional dollars for investment in, um, again, programmatic non-project specific investments in the plan. These could be, you know, complete streets retrofits, sidewalks, bike paths, things that really help the connective tissue of our multimodal transportation and will help us meet the GHD emission reduction levels. So that's what it is in concept. Here's what it is in specific. I'm not gonna go through these projects in detail. I'm happy to answer questions um, on them when we get here. What I'll note about this table, it seems like a lot. Part of why it seems like a lot is that recall also that when we started this process, as we often do between major plan updates, we did give folks an opportunity in what we call cycle amendments um, to request project-based amendments to uh, projects in the plan. So something you know, otherwise separate from GHD analysis, if something changed about a project, um, the cost change or the implementation timeframe change or the scope change, uh, we make those updates as well. Those are also being reflected in this table. So it's really bringing together both what was requested by project sponsors in those cycle amendments and what we're doing as part of the GHD analysis. Um, and then mitigation measures, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, we believe that mitigation measures will be needed to achieve uh, the reduction levels. We've analyzed the feasibility and applicability of um, several mitigation measures as they're defined um, through the implementation framework of the GHG rule, which is known as Policy Directive 1610 that I think most of you are familiar with. Um, that policy directive contains a multitude of potential mitigation measures and sort of the scoring and the math associated with those measures. So again, because we've been able to directly include many of those either in our modeling or our technical analysis, particularly if they're sort of project-based or investment-based, we've already covered those in a sense and we've included them in another way. So we're looking at potential mitigation measures that are around more policy-oriented things, um, voluntary things that uh, we could do as a region um, for which there would be multimodal transportation benefit, mobility benefit, um, and GHG benefit. So I've listed the measures here um, that we're proposing. They're also in a table in the attachment in your item. Uh, but again, you'll see that these are things are more around land use, uh, growth, parking policy, again, policy oriented things uh, related to our, our transit investment, urban centers, um, you know, things that um, again are um, voluntary that, that we could do as a region. Um, but for which there could be over time uh, measurable GHG reduction benefit. Um, again, as I said, attachment three show those, uh, shows those mitigation measures and it shows the estimated emission reduction associated with each measure. Um, we can get into math if you want to, but I think the, the takeaway is that as a staff, we've been pretty, you know, we wanna be able to stand behind the work that we're doing. We wanna feel comfortable that what we're proposing is something that's as realistic as possible. So we've been assertive, but frankly, you know, fairly, conservative around some of these measurements. Because remember, if we're talking about just to pick one, uh, for example, and we'll talk about this with the board um, tomorrow night, if we talk about um, you know, rezoning around or transitorian development around rail stations, well, this region has a legacy of doing that for a very long time. So for- Some more. I'm sorry, was there a- Okay. Um, so when we're looking at mitigation measures, we're actually looking at um, sort of additional things that we can do. So we're trying to we're trying to recognize what the region has already been doing, and we're saying is there sort of an increment of additional things we could do around these strategies, and that's what we're basing our our calculations on. Um, and then based on a request of our board, we prepared an interactive web map to illustrate the locations of specific geographies that are associated uh, with most of these mitigation measures. These geographies are not requirements per se, but they're um, sort of the mechanism that we use to help estimate sort of the potential for each of these mitigation measures. Um, I think the next slide shows a static map of those geographies. Um, and again, there's a link to the interactive web map. Uh, really appreciate our GIS staff for putting that together. Um, again, we're looking at applicable geographies that really relate to and make sense with the mitigation measures that we're looking at. So again, to use the same example, um, if we're looking at development around rail stations, you know, we're looking at half mile around rail stations as a geography, for example. Um, if we're looking at walking and biking strategies, we're looking at pedestrian focus areas from our um, active transportation plan, for example. So we've tried to be pretty specific around the potential geographies in which these measures would apply. 
Um, and then finally, this is sort of the, the sad part of the presentation, but we want to be transparent with you. You know, we've been we've been doing this work for several months. We've said, you know, we're trying to meet the emission reduction levels in the rule. We're trying to meet the requirements of the rule. But why are we trying to do that? Because if eventually the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan is not able to meet the requirements within the rule, part of the rule is a restriction on funds and restriction on project eligibility, um, both for uh, funds, as it says here, and this is language that comes from the rule, it's STBG, the Surface Transportation Block Grant, and the CMAC funds, the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Funds, and the Multimodal Option Funds that are allocated uh, both by Dr. Cog and by CDOT uh, within the Dr. Cog MPO area. So if the 2050 RTP for some reason was not able to meet the requirements of the rule, there would be these restrictions on funds um, and they would be restricted to projects that demonstrate that they are able to achieve um, reduced GHG emissions to help achieve the requirements of the rule. If this were to pass and, and look, we're doing everything we can so that that doesn't happen. We think we've got a pathway to get there so it doesn't happen, but we wanna be transparent what would happen if, if we didn't get there. It would affect project eligibility for Dr. Cog's upcoming 23 to 27 um, tip calls for projects three and four. Um, and it would also affect CDOT's um, 10 year plan um, allocations again within the Dr. Cog MPO area. The GHG rule also cites, um, or excuse me, the memo cites the GHG rule specific language on fund restrictions um, and the waiver process that is articulated within the GHG rule. There is a waiver process for um, individual projects. So that was a lot, but that's those were the things that we've been working on. We wanted to touch on those with you. Um, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh let me uh, call for questions here. First up is Director Shaw. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I uh, would simply like to make a comment that I appreciate the thought that actually went into these um, factors that will influence our ability to meet uh, greenhouse gas emission standards. And um, although I both the city of Lone Tree in our multifamily zoning prescribes uh, or or even looks to the the degree of density. I'm certainly going to find out, and I I, I like the idea of um, plans that meet these uh, density factors that help the region comply with greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that CMAC fund the awarded would, would certainly incentivize uh, a builder or um, developer to um, to maybe build an extra floor or um, think about the size of the units um, that they're building. So um, great thought and great way to present to us these factors that contribute to our ability to, um, as a region, meet these goals. Thank you. Uh, Director Levy? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not gonna take a lot of time to comment on this um, because we'll get another whack at it to, um, tomorrow at the at the uh, Dr. Cog board meeting. but. Um, I did just want to um, hear your thoughts and maybe the thoughts of other directors here about um, the the BRT um, plans and um, and how those would intersect with the system optimization plan that RTD is uh, has finalized now and you know just I guess acknowledging the fact that there are a lot of components of this plan, um, which is a very complex document that are not within the control of um, CDOT or uh, Dr. Cog. And you know the funding for the BRT corridors, uh, operating those corridors, making sure that the land use on those corridors supports BRT, and I'll, although the ones identified here actually I think do already, but um, you know just hearing a little more conversation about the aspects of this that are just not within the control of Dr. Cog. 
Yeah, thank you, Director Levy. It's an important question, so let me try and give a little bit of context. Um, first, just to be, again, to be clear and transparent, what we're proposing here is pretty aggressive, and there's no other way to describe it. Um, to advance, you know, to complete four bus rapid transit corridors by 2030, um, actually it's five in a sense, um, with the extension of Colfax. Um, so very, very aggressive for sure. We've given a lot of thought into this. What I will say is that for the BRT network generally defined in the 2050 RTP over the life of the plan, when we originally developed the 2050 RTP, we were pretty thoughtful together around the notion that these BRT corridors enable, in order for the, the region to be able to do this over time, and particularly now when we're trying to accelerate some of these corridors, it's going to take funding, it's going to take partnership, it's going to take involvement of multiple agencies, and the plan as adopted actually already reflects that. So to be clear, just because they're bus rapid transit corridors, they weren't tagged as BRT, pro or excuse me, as RTD projects, they weren't tagged as projects that RTD would finance, that they would construct, that they would you know, do everything, the sort of full spectrum of implementing those projects. We knew from the beginning that it would take funding from multiple agencies. It would take involvement from multiple agencies. That's how they're actually um, described in the original, in the adopted 2050 RTP. Uh, we're carrying that concept forward. As it, as it comes to these four corridors and RTD's role in particular, we've had conversations with RTD. Um, again, when it comes to planning and, and sort of implementing these corridors, funding these corridors, that is still a multi-agency strategy. That's what it's going to take. Um, RTD's involvement, I don't wanna speak for RTD, but just in terms of answering Director Levy's question, RTD staff has indicated to us that um, they can operate BRT corridors um, by sort of replacing the existing bus service. So like a Colfax or a federal um, where there's a lot of good bus service, even still today, um, they can deploy those resources towards operating, um, you know, future bus rapid transit in that corridor. Um, so as long as it's sort of a generally sort of net net equal to them in terms of resources, they can sort of redeploy resources they already have to help operate um, operate the corridors in these kind of transit rich environments. And that's why, as Director Levy noted, we're focusing on these in particular, um, these corridors by 2030. We think that they're uh, the most ready to go. They're the most sort of um, ripe corridors to try and advance and get them done quickly. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Director, I assume that answers your immediate questions. Um, uh, yeah. It, it does. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Director Cook, you're up. Hi, thank you. Um, Jacob, uh, in, I'm interested in the, uh, in the shift towards more emphasis on uh, transit-oriented development, development within the one half mile of stations, for example. How does that get operationalized in the funding cycles that Dr. Cog has? Like, oh, sorry. Um, Will you, for example, be able to help fund a cleanup that would make the development of the site possible? I'm just trying to get an idea of how that piece, that strategy gets implemented. Yeah, um, also a very good question. So I'll answer that in a couple of ways. One is that we do have through our existing and probably future mechanisms through the 2050 RTP, you know, some of our tips set aside, some of the, the funding that we control. Don't know if it can go towards cleanup of a site per se, but um, we do have a legacy of funding, you know, um, transit oriented planning, uh, the old CMPI set aside, the community mobility planning and implementation. I think I got that right, tip set aside. You know, we do have that legacy of sort of funding things through uh, the Transportation Improvement Program to kind of help and support um, some of the activities envisioned um, as you see here. When it comes specifically to the mitigation measures though, again, here it's not so much of a funding mechanism per se, it's um, the recognition that we're trying to build on what we've already done together as a region and really credit to local governments as much as anyone when it comes to some of these policy oriented things that are represented by the geographies in this map and by the proposed mitigation measures, whether it's rezoning, whether it's parking policy, whether it's development, redevelopment, development standards, you know, those things that are really the purview of local governments, you know, we have a rich legacy of local governments doing those things over time. And so from the mitigation measure perspective, it's not so much that we're looking for, you know, so many, you know, square footage of office being built or so, you know, so much of a product going in the ground. It's more, again, from that policy perspective, are there additional things that we can do to either rezone or redevelop or, again, around parking policy or whatever it may be? Can we put those policy mechanisms into place even more um, than, than we've already done so much in this region over time? And through that, 
um, you know, can we sort of prime the pump for additional sort of, you know, redevelopment or transit oriented development, change in parking policy, whatever it may be, um, through, you know, through that policy oriented work. So some of this is about funding, some of it is about the policy landscape um, that we would work with local governments and track over time as part of the overall framework of GHG compliance. Does that answer your question? It does. Thanks much. Thank you. Uh, next up, Commissioner Stanton. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Jacob, a great brief. Um, I'm really glad and excited that you're moving uh, bus rapid transit forward. Uh, question, as you look towards greenhouse gas reduction, what percent like uh, number of riders that are you projecting in order to get some of those greenhouse gas reductions? And the cynical part of me says we're still having trouble getting people onto existing transit and bus right now. And I want to make sure that we're not over hoping for certain things by 2025 and 2030. Yep. Um, thank you for that question. So again, just to be clear, just to be transparent, this is not a project-based analysis. And when I've said that it's going to take, you know, 15 or 20 things, that's partly why um, no individual strategy, no individual action, no individual project um, will help as much or hurt as much as we, as we might think sort of intuitively, right? And I'm just being honest about that. It's really a collection of things. It's, it's several BRT corridors, it's the programmatic strategies, it's the telework, it's, you know, it's the mitigation measures, it's, it's all those things together. Um, but you can see in this table that, I mean, again, the point of this table is kind of where, you know, where are we through each major phase of the analysis? And you can see in the model reduction from baseline, again, it looks small because it's million metric tons and it's a decimal point. Um, but when we start, when we start layering um, or latticing some of these strategies together, we do start seeing meaningful reductions. And that's why we've, in our technical analysis, tried to focus on the things that we think will make a difference. Will an individual BRT investment by itself make a regional difference over time? That's going to be small for sure. But when we start layering these things together and doing some of these things together, particularly when we start marrying some of the land use things and the multimodal transportation investments and we start building that over time, that's where we over time start seeing that difference. Thank you. And I really appreciate your doing off model reductions, adding that in to have the flexibility to include new things. Thank you. Uh, Ron, you have some uh, uh, information to add here. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Stanton, I just wanted to supplement a little bit of um, Jacob's excellent answer with just a couple of points. These BRT corridors that we've prioritized in the Regional Transportation Plan really were based on pretty extensive technical analysis. If you'll recall back to the regional BRT planning work that um, RTD led that we all worked on a few years ago. And so there has been a fair bit of technical analysis of those. And the ones that we've prioritized are the corridors that we believe have the most potential initial um, uh, success opportunity for those corridors and ones, quite frankly, that um, might compete very well for federal um, competitive grant programs to help us finance and, and implement. So while Jacob's absolutely correct, we, we are analyzing the regional transportation plan from a system regional level against the greenhouse gas targets. There has been a fair level of sort of technical review done to help prioritize those BRT quarters that we have, that we are um, identifying in the regional transportation plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, Jacob, I have a question on uh, slide. Uh, let me go back. What is it? Slide seven. Uh, attachment three shows the estimated greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, and can you direct me to where attachment three can be found? Oh, it should be in the packet. Um, okay, it's a table see. that. Okay, my apologies. I thought we included that in this version. It's certainly in the board packet for tomorrow night. Um, but if it's not there, we can. Okay. Oh, um, okay. Did you find it? Uh, it's a table that lists each of the mitigation measures and it shows the reduction levels associated with each mitigation measure by analysis here. There it is, attachment. That's oh, right above the presentation. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments from anyone? Uh, Executive Director Ricks. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, I Listen, again, I just wanted to 
re-emphasized, and I believe everybody on this call understands the, the tremendous amount of work that's been done by staff, as well as our stakeholders, the conversations that have occurred, to be able to move up some of these projects and, and get a understanding from, uh, from all of our stakeholders with regards to what is required in order to get to where we are today. I wanna to thank everybody. Uh, it, was a, it is a very, very tight timeline and for staff to be able to do what they've done to this point, I think is miraculous. Um, as you'll see, we're required by, by law to have this new plan adopted by October 1st and um, uh, for them to be, and quite frankly, we didn't really know the rules of the game until um, you know, sometime in, in May. So I wanna thank them so, so, so very much for the work and um, we look forward to further conversations about, about all of this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh I don't know if this is the right analogy, but what, what came to mind when I was reading through this uh, yesterday and then hearing Jacob today was the movie Apollo 13, when uh, uh, Jack Swagger, Kevin the Bacon, Kevin, uh, Kevin Bacon uh, played Jack Swagger when he was trying to restart the command module and he had to do everything in the right order and it had to be the right mix of everything. And so we are looking at so many variables here any one of which, as Jacob said, can contribute to or detract from, uh, depending on the level of implementation of each one. And it's, uh, it's a very daunting. So I, uh, uh, Executive Director X, I really appreciate your, uh, com your comments about the staff work that's gone on on this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, the uh, next, item are, next items are administrative member comment, other matters. The first up is CDOT's report. Do we have a report from CDOT? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I will, I'll take the report from CDOT item. Uh, so we're, uh, like the Dr. Cog board, um, focused quite a bit of our time on the um, meeting our compliance obligations for the greenhouse gas rule. Um, we're bringing to the Transportation Commission tomorrow at our, our workshop meeting, sort of initial look at where we stand from a compliance perspective. Um, we're a little bit uh, behind Dr. Cog in that we we'll probably won't have the full set of information that you all provided until our August meeting, um, but we are in the same boat of needing to have a compliant plan by um, October 1 of, of this year. Um, to that end, we're, the other thing we're quite focused on is the update to our 10-year plan, and we are going to start talking to the commission as well about those updates. Uh, the focus this month will be on areas of the state that don't include Dr. Cog. We'll probably bring the Dr. Cog region, uh, region one and region four um, for NCDOT speak to the uh, commission in August. Um, other than that, you know, we uh, are continuing to deal with um, Glenwood Canyon falling apart um, quite a bit. Um, we're also just uh, continuing to see an uptick in fatalities um, that I know we're all sort of noticing across the state in the metro area. Um, and so safety continues to be one of those issues that we uh, lean into quite a bit and try to figure out how we can encourage people to make a little bit better decisions when they're out on the roadway system. Um, we did uh, have been kicking off our expanded, um, some of our expanded bus service with, with Pegasus that launched uh, earlier this summer, which has been an exciting development for us on the positive side of the ledger. Um, and I think I'll leave it there and with just a pause to see if, if any of my colleagues or commissioners from CDOT want to add anything to this report. Before I move on to uh, Executive Director Sorstein, do we have any CDOT uh, commissioners who want to add to that? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stewart. Thanks very much. Well, I was hoping that Chair Stanton would uh, jump in here, but wanted to say that this week will be very busy for CDOT Commission because we are going to have an in-person retreat for the first time in the last two years. Um, and uh, Commissioner Stanton, if you want to talk a little bit about that retreat, I think it would be interesting to Dr. Cog to know what it is that we're looking at this year um, moving forward, having not been able to do some of the things that we did in the past due to the COVID restrictions. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Stewart. 
we are going to have a retreat and uh, we always start out with legal views and we're going to also have a lot of brainstorming uh, throughout the commission. We have uh, several new commissioners. We're trying to make sure that we surface all ideas as quickly as possible. We're also gonna be talking um, and discussing with our chief engineer, our maintenance, et cetera, and uh, Rebecca White and Greenhouse Gas, of course, is always uh, a big piece of this. We've changed the name of the ad hoc committee in the Transportation Commission, which has been working the greenhouse gas rule. It's now the Agency Coordination Committee, still led by Lisa Hickey, <clears throat> Karen Stewart, Barbara Vasquez. And this uh, subcommittee has been extremely important in uh, keeping us informed and also uh, flowing information to and from um, the CDOT team and the other agencies, CDPHE, et cetera. So, a great deal of our effort is going to be focused on uh, sharing information, listening. We're also, we and the executive management team are making a lot of efforts to reach out to uh, diverse parts of the state, uh, Weld County, Eastern Colorado, Southeast, Southwest, et cetera. I know Rebecca White's involved in uh, many things to try to get as much public comment and of course, our stack has been uh, very vigorous uh, recently in uh, giving us information about greenhouse gas and other things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Executive Director uh, Silverstein, do you have some questions on this or some comments? No, oh, good morning. No, I just wanted to just um, provide another announcement um, in addition to what's been reported out. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Oh, okay. Great. Well, I just wanted to let the, the uh, group know that uh, the Regional Air Quality Council is advancing its um, latest generation of our ozone planning efforts to our board for um, consideration at their August meeting. So we have a draft ozone plan that uh, projects that we will come into compliance with um, one of the two standards on time. Um, the, the weaker standards due date is uh, 2026. And our projections are that we're making progress in improving ozone, reducing emissions, and that we should come into compliance on time. The uh, flip side is that there's a second more stringent ozone standard that has a due date for compliance in the shorter term of 2023. And um, we will not be coming into compliance with that standard on time, but we are advancing our plans to the Air Commission taking credit for all of the, uh, the good work that's been described today in the, the greenhouse gas emission reduction program and all of the work that uh, Dr. Cog and the other transportation planners, planning community have, um, have implemented over the years. And so we're, we are making that progress to improve those own conditions. Our plan is in front of the board. If the board approves, the, the plan would move over to the Air Quality Control Commission for its consideration in the fall. And um, no additional new strategies are part of this plan um, at this time. It's uh, premature to, uh, to bring in new strategies that, um, you know, in this late in the game, we already have a, a whole host of newer strategies that are um, on their way to um, full implementation over these coming years. But that's um, not the end of the story. We um, know we're not going to comply with the um, the tougher standard on time. And so there's more work to do. And we have a whole list of strategy options we're exploring and we'll get into um, over the, the next year or so uh, to make recommendations for, for further um, emission reduction strategy uh, programs. So I just wanted to provide that update to the RTC and um, invite any of, our, uh, of you or your staff to um, participate in our public comment process, which is underway, written public comment, and then um, formal public comment um, uh, in person at the um, the board meeting in August, and, and that's on August 5. So that's um, that's my update. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, next up is report uh, from RTD. We have um, uh, CEO Deborah Johnson here. We have several uh, board uh, board members here. We have uh, Bill Van Meter here. Uh, would anyone from RTD like to uh, give us a report? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Vince Busick here. I'll start if that's okay. Thank, oh, certainly. Go ahead. Great. Just a, a few things. We were kind of a, a busy summer. So um, just on a personal level, something I'm happy about, uh, 
last board meeting on June 28th, I appointed a zero emission vehicle ad hoc committee of directors Williams, Geisinger, Deschel, and Bouquet to study the possibilities uh, surrounding zero emission vehicles, their implementation and integration of the system. Uh, we've also got a lot of things going on with our union station security upgrades. We've got a dedicated portion of our website that has uh, live data about what's going on. Uh, we've got short, medium, and long-term plans to improve uh, security and safety in the customer experience in Union Station and the bus concourse. The same applies to our route security on buses and trains, our uh, impact teams that have been created to address the uh, security needs on, on trains and buses. Uh, that information can be found on the website as well. We also have a fair study and equity analysis system-wide that is going on. Um, the timeline is also on our website and, and that's a big deal. But most importantly, at, at least for uh, the critical timeline is our Zero Fair for Better Air initiative that is coming up beginning in August of this year. Uh, it's a grant program that was created by Colorado Senate Bill 22180 administered by the Colorado Energy Office uh, with the intended purpose of reducing ground level ozone. Uh, but the program also highlights not only the environmental benefits of transit, but also the mobility benefits of transit. And it's important to note that all RTD services are included from bus, light and commuter rail, paratransit and flex ride services. Everything that we offer is free in August. Um, the current service plan, it's important to note, it, it, thanks <laughs> Director Shaw, um, we will not have increased service or additional service. We will have our regular menu of services uh, available to the riding public. And that, of course, is due to uh, our people problem and, and getting operators and, and, and you know, bus drivers and train operators on board. And we're making some great progress and strides in that regard. But for August 2022, we're going to have our, our regular menu of services, which I think should be interesting and uh, helpful for the riding public. Next Thursday, July 28th at Union Station at the commuter rail platform, we're going to have a kickoff uh, event and uh, press conference. Um, we're going to have community outreach also and talk about things like our customer code of conduct, talk about the, the transit watch app that everybody mm -hmm. that rides transit ought to have on their phone. If you see something, say something. So uh, these data points that we, we gather from our transit watch app are really helpful to our police impact teams in determining where they're going to provide uh, service. So that's the big thing coming up August 1st. Media kits and information are available on the RTD website. So please, uh, to the extent you can in your communities and organizations, uh, promote the Zero Fare for Better Air initiative. Uh, that's all I have right now. I'll turn it over to any other director or our GM CEO, Deborah Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll wait a moment to see if any other director of the RTD board would like to offer up any information before I uh, proceed. Not me. I just want to say, yay, zero fear. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Director Williams. So yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for that information. Just to provide a little more uh, information, one to ensure that all of you are aware that you're uh, welcome to participate in the media event that's taking place as uh, Chair Busick indicated on uh, Thursday, July 28th at 1030 at Denver Union Station. And it's very important as we talk about the various elements in which we'll be um, providing information on, more specifically recognizing that we will have zero fare during the, during the month of August. We wanna manage expectations and let people know what's on the horizon as it relates to the fair study and equity analysis, as well as reimagine RTD. Oftentimes people have commented on that. And really that is our comprehensive operations analysis, recognizing it is a plan. And typically one does not adopt a plan going out 25 years, but it's used as guiding principles in reference to how we can best leverage um, our transit service delivery in um, this environment. More specifically as well, wanted to stress that um, in coordinating with a multitude of different entities, we have sent information to more than 173 organizations or entities as it relates to Zero Fare for Better Air. And on that webpage that Chair Busick referenced, um, there's logos, templates for print, web, social media, 
icons, photography, fact sheets, key messages. And I wanna say that I've seen a lot come through from um, a lot of different organizations in which I get um, email information as well. So uh, wanted to stress that as we go forward and um, encourage active engagement and managing expectations. And also as we talk about zero fare for our services, one important element is to recognize those that are using paratransit, they have to be eligible participants, meaning they're already um, have been admitted to the program and have done their assessment to utilize the American with Disability uh, Act mandated paratransit service. At this juncture, I would like to yield the floor to um, Bill Van Meter to talk about a critical item that uh, spawned out of the Accountability Committee as it relates to service council. So with that, um, Mr. Van Meter, I will yield the floor to you, sir. Thank you. And Chair? Go ahead, Bill. All right, thank you. Yeah, just one, it, um, hard to imagine that there's yet another interesting topic from RTD, but I think this one is, is important to hear. The board last month acting on recommendations from the RTD Accountability Committee, which many of the folks on this call um, were involved in directly, Dr. Cog, staff support, um, or following closely the Accountability Committee recommended that RTD form sub-regional service councils to increase input from local communities. The RTD board just last month approved a plan for implementing sub-regional service councils moving forward. They laid out a path for staff to follow and work with local jurisdictions in five sub-regional areas throughout um, the RTD district and to engage and provide, engage in and provide meaningful input on service matters and other matters um, in that sub-regional format to RTD staff and to um, the policy body, to the board of directors. So I just wanted to let folks know that that sub-regional service council set of recommendations from the accountability committee followed up on, acted on, and we have clear direction from the board regarding that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any other uh, RTD uh, director want to uh, add comments? Thank you. If not, we'll go to uh, questions or comments from uh, Director Levy. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, these updates from RTD are wonderful and uh, really mm -hmm. exciting everything that is going on right now. Um, I just had a quick question and it may be um, totally obvious, but it um, on the zero fare month, um, we're gonna do everything we can here in Boulder County to promote that. But I was wondering and hoping that you'll be tracking the number of boardings that you have, uh, even though you won't be um, taking a fare so that we can really see uh, how effective it is to have this zero fare opportunity. And then, you know, assuming that you are going to track the boardings and, and we'll get some data to compare when you'll uh, have that information available. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Deborah Johnson, General Manager and CEO. Thank you very much, Director uh, Levy, for that information. Most definitely, basically, what we need to ensure is that we are garnering an understanding of the type of boardings that we're having. This will help inform um, our plans as we go forward with the fair study and equity analysis. It's another data point. So just for clarification, we have on our vehicles what we call automatic passenger counters, um, which will enable us to help understand customer response, um, outside of that, on the um, fare box, there is a key. We're not collecting fares, let me be clear, but there's mechanisms in reference that could be depressed to help us, a key that could be depressed that helps us collect data as well. More so what we're asking for as well, we plan to use the analytics from the Transit Watch app. Um, and then also we have our ride checkers that will be out in the system as well, which is another data point that helps along with the automatic passenger counters, uh, because basically it's a uh, checks and balances because oftentimes uh, those data points could be misunderstood if somebody's carrying a briefcase or a bag or something along those lines. So we will be collecting all that information. The second part of your question is about when will that data be available? Recognizing that we do contract out some of our fixed route service as well as paratransit service, we're going to work with our third party contractors in order to garner that information as well. So 
uh, recognizing the extensive uh, service deployment that we have. This information won't be readily available in 24 hours. Generally, what we do is we collect data. Um, it takes um, a couple of days in which to do that, but as we synthesize and discern all the data points, we plan to have that information readily available uh, probably uh, mid-September, third week of September, contingent upon when we can get that information from our third-party uh, partners. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I'd like to ask one. I'm curious how the uh, subregions geographies will be defined. Uh, how many will there be? Uh, will they coincide with director districts or will they overlap? Uh, 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 Bill, do you have more information on that? Yeah, Chair, I do. Um, so there are five sub-regional districts identified and we spent some time looking at travel beat patterns and behavior um, using location-based um, survey data that we actually had available through Reimagine RTD, and we looked at transit travel sheds, and they don't fall neatly, right. and they we recognize that they're likely to evolve over time, um, and so we don't intend for these to be static boundaries, um, but it's a good place to start, and we'll and we'll see how well it works, and I think the board in, has interest in being flexible and making sure that from a ge geography and all standpoints, it works well. Boulder has a fairly separate and unique, particularly from a transit service perspective, um, um, travel market and travel shed. Boulder is one. And then there's a Northeast, Southeast, Southwest and Northwest geographies. And um, mm -hmm. so it's pretty simple and well-defined and we'll see how well that works. Thank you. I welcome this. This is I will follow this very closely, and uh, thank you, uh, CEO Johnson, for the invitation. I my schedule won't allow me to be at your press conference. I tried to uh, juggle some things around, but it, it won't work for me. But I wish uh, I wish uh, a lot of luck to uh, this uh, fare free month. Zero fare. <laughs> I gotta get get the terminology correct uh, because uh, nothing is free. It still has to be paid for. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. I'll look forward to those ridership figures as well. Any other comments or questions on the RTD report? Seeing none, are there any other matters from members? Seeing none, going once, going twice, three times. Thank you very much. Our next meeting is August 16th. Uh, we will discuss, I guess, at the uh, at the executive committee level, uh, executive director Rex, uh, whether this will be continue to be virtual it depends on the uh, numbers that we see or whether we will be back in person. Down yep. there. So, but, but we'll let you all know uh, well in advance. Thank you. Uh, with no other business to conduct here, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, folks, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good Tuesday, everyone. Thank you.